This is Horror Podcast. Welcome to This Is Horror, a podcast for readers, writers, and creators. I'm Michael David Wilson, and every episode alongside my co-host Bob Pastorella, we chat with Masters of Horror about writing, life lessons, creativity, and much more. Now today's guest is Connor Habib. He is the host of Against Everyone with Connor Habib. He is an author, a lecturer, and a sex workers' rights advocate. And his debut novel, Hawk Mountain, is out right now. And wow, what a fascinating conversation we had with Connor. I really do think you're all in for a treat today. He is such a smart and intelligent guy with so many insights into such a vast array of topics. And for anyone who's familiar with his podcast Against Everyone, you know that already. You know what a well-read and articulate gentleman Connor Habib is. And I would actually urge you, if you enjoy some of the more philosophical and esoteric conversations that we have on This Is Horror, then do check out Against Everyone. There are actually a number of horror-flavoured episodes with people like Ramsey Campbell and Paul Tremblay. So I think there's certainly crossover appeal in terms of Against Everyone and This Is Horror. But predominantly in this conversation, we talk about Connor's writing. We talk about Hawk Mountain, which is his debut novel. Although we get even more into that one in part two. But let me just tell you about the debut. It's perhaps the best debut this year. There's a lot packed into it. It is so many genres all at once. It is simultaneously horror, coming of age, a literary thriller, as even an element of romance in a kind of twisted way. And you add to that the social commentary, the poignant metaphors and It really is a must read. But don't take my word for it. Take Clive Barker's. He said of it, Habib's debut novel is a bleak, dark adrenaline rush. Now a real strong point of Hawk Mountain is the way that it'll sneak up on you with some of the twists and some of the darkness. So I do think this is a book that actually benefits from saying very little about it so that you get maximum impact as a reader. But let me just read you the two opening lines in terms of the blurb. An unsettling and emotional riveting thriller about fathers and sons, revenge and forgiveness and ghosts from our past. A book not to read alone in the dark. I'll tell you, it's a book that's also available in audio format, actually narrated by Connor himself. And that's very, very well done too. So plenty of options in terms of how you consume it. You can go for the audio book, you can get it on Kindle, you can get the hardcover. But what you must do is get it. All right, before we jump into the conversation... A little bit of an advert break. The Demonic Brilliance Film Festival is a competitive horror film festival celebrating excellence in horror. Organized by horror filmmakers for horror filmmakers, it is now open for submissions. There are awards in all major categories and a submission fee is just $6.66. 100% of submission fees and ticket sales are donated to charities. Does your film have what it takes to be awarded Best Film at the Demonic Brilliance Film Festival? Check out all the details at filmfreeway.com slash Demonic Brilliance Film Festival. The deadline to submit is August 31st. Hey horror fiends, it's Tim Levin here from the UK. I'm delighted to be an author guest at Horror on Main. 
really hope you can join us there it's going to be a lot of fun it's going to be scary there's going to be lots of books for sale oh it's going to be glorious so i hope really hope to see you there i'm looking forward to it so much be scary keep reading be safe horror on maine a new weekend convention for the horror community We've been going to conventions for over 20 years and are changing up the little things to make the big picture amazing. Join us Memorial Day weekend 2023 in Hunt Valley, Maryland. Come to the block party and meet your new neighbors. See horroronmain.com for details. Okay, well, with that said, let us delay no more. It is Connor Habib on This Is Horror. Connor, welcome to This Is Horror. Hey guys, very excited to be talking with you. Oh yeah, it's great to have you here. And we just both wrapped up reading Hawk Mountain and we're absolutely blown away by it. So congratulations on a stunning debut. Oh, thank you so much. And thanks for, thanks for reading it. <laughs> oh yeah, well, I know that you recently finished a bit of a mini tour of Ireland, so you did some events for Hawk Mountain. So how did the events go? Yeah, um, <clears throat> so I just, I did, I did about two, uh, two weeks, a little over two weeks in the US, and then I came home and uh, did a bunch of events here. I still have one as of the date of this recording tomorrow, so it's not done yet. They've been great. I mean, <clears throat> almost all the events that I've done have been completely packed, which is, I'm told not a usual thing for a de debut novel, which is great. Um, and it's been, you know, I think for me being someone who hosts, you know, his own podcast, I was really happy to be asked questions. Um, I mean, I do other podcasts and, you know, like this one, but it was, you know, when I'm researching other guests and stuff like that, I'm going deep into their work and their, minds and what they're up to. And so writing is so lonely, obviously. And so I've had this idea that I've been holding basically to myself for such a long time. And so, yeah, then it gets out there and people read it and it's great. But then also doing a tour, having people ask me questions was really gratifying. Um, it's not like my normal job of podcasting. <laughs> so that felt uh, amazing. People asked really really great questions. And I had <clears throat> really amazing people in conversation with Caitlin Doty from Ask a Mortician um, in the US, Paul Tremblay, the horror writer, um, you know, uh, Jared Middleton, who also wrote a horror novel, you know, in Seattle. So, and a bunch of other people as well. So it was just really fantastic. Yeah. And in terms of getting support from other writers, I mean, I know that something that was particularly affecting for you, and perhaps that's even understating it, is you got a blurb from Clive Barker. Yeah. Yeah. <clears throat> I mean, that was, that was huge for me in a lot of ways. Um, you know, a lot of people who had blurbed the book were people that I knew or had been on the podcast. So there are... You know, other horror writers there, Paul Tremblay and Ramsey Campbell and Brian Evanson had all, and, and Kelly Link had all given blurbs, which was great. Um, and I did, <clears throat> just <laughs> to preface this, I did when I sent the book out to people say to everybody, look, if you don't like the book, or even if it just doesn't hit you, please do not blurb it, because I just don't think that that's really good for literature if people are blurbing books that they don't like. Um, so, you know... And some people didn't. <laughs> there were some people I sent out to that I never heard from again, you know, that I kind of knew. And I, I was fine with that. And and those people are obviously assholes. No, no, I was totally fine with it. <laughs> no, I was totally fine with it. But <clears throat> it was really important to me, you know, to say that. But, you know, with Clive, I don't really know Clive. Like, we've had some email interactions back and forth that, you know, even that was really meaningful to me. But when I just said, hey, can I send you the book? And then I spoke with him, like he wanted to talk with me about it. And he just was sort of like very, you know, enthusiastic and really loved it. And that was quite overwhelming. You know, first of all, having someone say, can I speak with you about your book is your idol? Because I had read, I'd been reading Clyde Barker's work since I was like, you know, I mean, a kid. And even when I was 
very young, I would make fake book covers for the things that I was writing. Cause I, I started writing maybe when I was like eight years old, not this book, uh, other stuff. Yeah, obviously. Yeah. <laughs> but I started, you know, writing and what I would do is I would make fake book covers and I'd put the blurbs of authors that I liked on the back. Like I would make fake blurbs cause I was seeing this whole world of books, you know, um, uh, where people were blurbing each other's books. And I always thought that was so cool. So I would draw the cover and then on the back, I would make up a fake quote and attribute it to, you know, a real author just for myself. Obviously those books weren't going anywhere. And, uh, I would always include Clive's name <laughs> on the back. So, I mean, it was quite a, you know, it was like the, a, you know, a long game of the secret or something like that, that it happened, uh, decades later and pretty astonishing, but it also just, it just meant so, so much to me because he's really helped form my imagination around horror and the body and desire and just even writing in a very sort of, you know, f uh, feverish, but kind of almost romantic, I would say way. And I, I owe so much to him uh, as a writer. And so I, that was, it was particularly, yeah, meaningful. Yeah. Yeah. And talking about, I mean, growing up and reading Clive's work, I mean, you were raised by an Irish American mother and a Syrian father. So I'm wondering what was the kind of dynamic like in the home growing up and in terms of art and creativity, how encouraging were they? Yeah, it's an interesting question. I mean, I, I don't, or maybe it has an interesting answer. Like my mom was very opposed to me reading or watching anything that had violence in it. She was not really like a, ashamed of or afraid of or tried to shield me or my sister from like seeing anything that had any kind of sexual content. I mean, she didn't encourage it or anything, but she didn't, <laughs> right. it, didn't it didn't really bother her. <clears throat> but violent content, she's always, because of certain things that happened in her life, she always felt very upset about. And my father just kind of, my father couldn't really read and write English so well. So, I mean, he would tell us stories from Syria when we were kids that some of them had a very sort of fairy tale esque um, scary element to them. Like he would often tell us these like stories about hyenas and the village. And all. I mean, it's just very interesting stuff to like grow up listening to as a kid in, you know, small town, Pennsylvania. And, but my older brother, my half brother is 13 years older than me. And he was always reading science fiction, fantasy, and horror. And that's how I ended up hearing about Clyde Barker, but it also really stimulated my imagination. I remember he was reading a copy of um, Death Bird Stories by Harlan Ellison. And he, my mom had asked him to read. My mom said, will you read me a story some sometime? And my brother said, yeah, my brother has a very dark sense of humor. Yeah. yeah. So he read her this story, which uh, I forget the name of the story, but it's in Death Bird Stories. And it's about gargoyles all the gargoyles in a city coming to life and just slaughtering everybody in the city and um it you know i mean it's quite gory and gruesome and so that's what he read to my mother who didn't like stories about violence and uh and so she was even like fixated on like making sure i didn't read this book in particular um that my brother had kind of comically wielded against her and uh I asked him about it. I was like, well, what is it about this book? And he said, well, these stories, they can really change the way you think. And of course, I mean, what could, <laughs> what could make you want to read something more, yeah. you know, yeah. um, like, holy shit, you know, um, it's like something that, you know, you would hear Alan Moore saying now, you know, <laughs> it's like, it's, a, it's such a profound thing to hear. Like, oh, it's not just messing around, you know, this can really actually alter the way you walk through the world if you allow it in. And that was very appealing to me. So I think that really stimulated my imagination. My brother also liked Clive Barker. So I, I heard about him through my brother and, you know, it was a lot of that. Like I would sneak books, you know, I'd go to 
it was like Brentano's or Walden books at the time. And I would find a horror novel and I would, you know, read a chapter of it there. Or I would take it out from the library and try to hide it from my mom. She, you know, caught me reading it um, <laughs> by Stephen <laughs> King. And, you know, of course, you know, and she just read, a, she picked it up. She read a few pages of it. And she was like, nope. <laughs> um, and And sometimes she would sort of let some things sneak by. And of course, you know, all the books that you read, and th- this figures into Hawk Mountain, maybe we'll talk about this a little later um, too, but like all the books you read in high school as a suburban kid in, you know, in Pennsylvania, or like even rural, it was like suburban slash rural, it's a post-industrial landscape that I grew up in, um, was, you know, all those books are extremely violent, scary, <laughs> horrifying, <laughs> you know, Lord of the Flies, a uh, separate piece, the pearl, you know, of mice and men. They're all they all have this like, you know, edge of violence to them. And uh so I think that's where it was like all that kind of stuff blending together that informed me as far as horror goes. Um I could go on and on about this, but I'll just I'll leave it there. I don't know if I'm answering your question exactly, but yeah. Oh, I, I think you are, and it's certainly really interesting so i mean you please go on for as long as <laughs> as you wish to because th- this is absolutely uh-huh. <laughs> fascinating but i mean as you're talking and even you know hearing that your mother read a few lines of it and made the decision there and then like nope you're not seeing that and it, it makes me think you know making this art and these books forbidden i mean it must have made you crave them even more it really is basic psychology if you're told you can't <laughs> right, exactly. have something then you're gonna want it <laughs> you know this is making it even better totally yeah i mean to- obviously you know i mean parents <laughs> they should they should know that i yeah. think she was a little more she was a little more lenient as i got older um because she knew i th- she knew it wasn't gonna you know, go away my interest in these things. Um, so she would try to talk with me about it a bit, but you know, it was pretty strict growing up. And I think, you know, I don't, I don't exactly begrudge her of it, uh, you know, for it because she did have, like I said, there was a lot of violence in her life, you know, when she was younger, but I do think that, you know, it was a bit of a disservice to me because, I really wanted to explore and understand that part of my imagination. And I was also raised without any religion in my life. I was fortunate enough to be raised without any religion. I'm I'm quite a spiritual person now, but because horror, especially, you know, offers up so much of the kinds of drama and supernatural presence and, you know, even theological questioning that religion does, I think it offers that, you know, and it offers some of those themes, questions, concerns in a different way. And so I think that that was part of my craving there as well. And it would have been great to be able to talk with, you know, openly with my family about that kind of stuff. There was just so much hiding when I was growing up. I mean, there's hiding that I was, you know, as I got older, that I realized I was attracted to guys. There was the hiding of like my Syrian identity in a way because it was a very racist town. So I, you know, people kind of knew that I was Syrian, but didn't really know what that was to be quite honest. Um, they used to call me a slur that, you know, really is, I mean, it shouldn't be for anybody, but it was for Indian people. They would level that against me because they didn't know the difference between Indian people and, and Arab people. They, you know, I w- had to hide that I was like, intelligent, interested in books and arts and literature and, and, you know, weird movies and, you know, all that kind of stuff and and philosophy when I was a kid. So there was just a lot of hiding going on. Um, And so having this other thing to hide, is kind of like, you know, that, that was not, that was not great. It would have been better to be able to sort of explore that, you know, a bit more openly. Yeah, yeah. And I wonder, was there a pivotal moment or pivotal moments when you stopped hiding and you started 
embracing and you know, showing your identity. And I imagine this came in kind of waves rather than <laughs> immediately, you know, yeah. all, all facets. Yeah, I don't think, I mean, I, <laughs> it's still, you know, I mean, a lot of life is kind of a game of hide and go seek with the aspects of yourself that you don't feel others will understand that you mm. feel isolated and alienated in. And, you know, and sometimes that's, I don't want to say hiding is appropriate, but you don't, like most people don't talk about, you know, their sexual desires with their aunt, you know what I mean? Mm. <laughs> like yeah. there are certain places where we sort of express and then, and then repress or we, we, you know, hide and, and then uh, show up. But I do think like, as, as you're saying, like when I was younger, yeah, it all just sort of, you would find the right people to talk to about it. You know, I'd go to punk rock shows and that was a great place. Um, and, and I used to set up punk rock shows and I even for a little while started a, a record label because I had a lot of friends who were in bands. Um, when I was 18, about I, I started this record label. It was a total failure. I had no idea what I was doing, but I did put out a few records. And I would set up these punk shows all the time at the Syrian hall in my town. There was like a Syrian basically it's not a VFW, but like a Syrian, you know, uh, society hall that people would rent out that was owned by Syrian people. And I would rent that out and set up punk shows for touring bands. And I think that that was a place where people were going for art that wasn't just about fun. I mean, that was certainly fun, but you know, you would have these post-punk bands come and play, you know, I have bands like, um, you know, I'd have Ted Leo and his band Chisel play and the Dismemberment Plan. I don't know if these bands mean anything to anybody who's listening to this. The Dismemberment Plan and the Van Pelt and um, Karate. And, you know, so these bands that were playing real mu serious music and you would go for a reason that was more than just fun. You would go to engage with art, engage with your body, you know, and to have conversations with each other about what had happened, what you had seen, what the music reminded you of, what it made you think of. And I think that that was really, I mean, that was a huge saving grace for me was punk rock and punk music. Yeah. And I mean, you were saying regarding books and I think, you know, the same can apply to music and to albums that they can change the way you think. So, I mean, on that note, I'm wondering if you can recall either albums or bands or books that have fundamentally changed the way that you think or perhaps changed an aspect in terms of who you are. Oh, gosh, like so many. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I, I think if we're relating to that sort of music time, um, there's always bands that were doing something that, like I had no reference for in my sort of sonic palette, I guess. Um, you know how like when you eat a new kind of cuisine and like you're eating new kinds of foods and tasting new things and you're like, what the hell is this? You know, like the first time you have Thai food ever in your life or whatever. That's what some of these bands were like. There was no, I couldn't figure out a reference point. So like, uh, Brainiac is a band there. They there's a documentary came out about them kind of recently. And I think it became popular merely by virtue of Mark Hamill, like tweeting about it. Once, right. you know? But, um, <laughs> but uh, Brainiac was this completely just crazed band. Um, and I, and, and there's another band called Joan of Arc, which um, I was happy to have the, the front person from that band on my show. Um, and those two bands, just to take an example, they were doing ex wildly experimental music that just touched slightly on pop and punk music. And I think for me, just thinking, okay, there's so much available to me, like as someone that's creating something or someone who wants to be an artist or even just wants to, you know, make change in the world if I just sort of push on what I think is available, possible, doable, like I don't have to stay in the constraints um, 
that were laid down. That was all, it, those bands were extremely important to me in that regard. I think, I mean, I, I could go on and on with, with music like that, but I think um, that sentiment, I mean, and that for me was the real punk rock sentiment. It wasn't about like, well, some of it I think was maybe about the politics of it, like who was selling out. That was a big question back when I was a kid and we talk about punk rock music who signed a major record label deal and they must be terrible for doing that, which was right. <laughs> kind of a fun <laughs> thing. Um, Cause now like you would even think twice about having that conversation now, like you would never have that conversation. Now you'd be like, wow, they actually made money, you know, <laughs> <Not> <laughs> making music. But I think um, most of it had to do with our people doing things that are sort of, you know, l- you know, liberatory that are like, are they doing things that liberate the, the medium that they're working in? And, redeem it, elevate it, change it, push on it. And that was always so exciting to me. And that really felt like what punk rock was. Um, And still, to some extent, feels that way to me. It's not like just a kind of punchy sound um, that stays within familiar constraints. Um, I think for books, like it might be surprising given that I loved reading horror so much that some of the things and, and science fiction and fantasy that some of the things that really changed me were the kind of bridge books that I would read that um, led me into reading sort of more, should we say standard literature, but it's, I don't, I don't really consider it like standard. So like I, I remember a friend gave me a book of short stories by an author named Donald Barthelme. Mm-hmm. Donald Barthelme would write these really surrealist, absurd stories and, um, there's uh there's a great story called the school where it's very short where like the teacher just keeps buying the kids different kinds of pets and they just keep dying and then they like adopt an orphan and you know it just keeps getting like worse and worse and worse and like a lot of the stories are like that you know there's a there's um Anyway, well, I, without going into Don, all of Donald Barthamy's like um, oeuvre, I'll just say, just go check him out. But that helped me sort of move from reading only science fiction, fantasy, and horror to reading more literary fiction, which I'm really glad it did. Because nothing, you know, when you read when you read that kind of stuff, when you read genre fiction, which is so enriching, you can end up excluding things that don't have those weird imaginal elements because you really you know you can end up leaning on those but you can end up leaning on them in a way that they just become tropes that um you stop being sort of enriched by the genre if if that's all you read now i'm not saying that that's true of everybody i think that um plenty of people just get whatever they need from the genre that they read but for me there was this whole world of literature explored. It was like the rest of the bookstore that I never explored, you know, because <laughs> there was like the small science fiction, fantasy, and even smaller horror section, and then the rest of the literary fiction section. And I never looked at any of that other stuff. And I'm so glad that I did. And I think another book, I, I just like hooked up with some guy who gave me a copy of Play It As It Lays by Joan Didion. And that book, that is in a lot of ways... um I don't want to say it's a horror novel because it's not, but it has horror elements. It's a very piercing, harsh book. Um, The chapters are, and this was before really almost anybody was doing this. The chapters are, you know, could be like a sentence long or a paragraph. Now a lot of people do that, but they weren't doing it back then. And it's all about this actress whose life is just kind of falling apart with like, you know, ennui and just, you know, being disinterested in the world and having a few harsh things happen in her life. But um, it's so pointed. It's in some ways very mean spirited and, um, and startling. And there's lots of imaginations about death and suffering in the book. And, it, but it's so precise. And, you know, Joan Didion said this really startling thing about the book, which is something like, um, you know, I wanted people to, forget this book as they read it. Um, Mm -hmm. And it does feel like that. There's lots of empty space in the book, lots of negative space. And so that also created this sort of bridge for me. And the the bridge is really important, not because I want to leave genre behind, but when you ask me what books had such an impact on me, like that was what helped me 
you know, really develop style, develop, you know, an understanding of horror as truly having a place in, in just the regular critically acclaimed literary world, because horror was, and remains to some extent really stigmatized, you know, critically at least. And, um, you know, but I loved it and I loved all, I, you know, I loved all genres, including just the realistic literary genre. And it sort of helped me figure out how they all kind of fit together. So, you know, to sum that all that up, you know, the music, like on the one hand was just pushing the absolute boundaries of my imagination in a way that in some ways, like even a lot of the books I was reading couldn't do because it was really, really, really challenging me. And the, and the, the books were the ones that were creating bridges and connections between all kinds of writing. Yeah. And in terms of that stigma, what do you think it is that we can do as both readers and creatives to fight against the stigma against horror? Um, you know, it's a, it's a tough one because, you know, people have rightly pointed out that like, when we say that like, oh, no one takes science fiction seriously or comic books seriously or whatever, like obviously they are the biggest money makers ever now, you know, I mean, like far beyond any other kind of like film or books or whatever, um, you know, but, you know, with horror, so in some ways I want to say like, look, horror films aren't stigmatized, like a lot of horror films will do great even if they're critically panned. Um, and then if they're critically acclaimed, though, people will be like, that transcends the genre. You know, <laughs> like people yeah. say that. Um, and I always find that like, well, that's not really great. Um, I think that uh, the way I always look at it is, you know, the same way, honestly, that I look at pornography, which is something else that lots of people enjoy, but is highly stigmatized and like horror and, and certain imagery there, like also regulated in ways that other kinds of art isn't regulated and yet also wildly popular. And the, and the lesson is to say like, what does this have to offer the rest of the world? Not like what can horror learn from literature, but what can the rest of the literary world learn from horror? And I think mm -hmm. to the extent that we look into that and offer it, um, back, I think that we kind of smooth out that, you know, that fold, which seems like a chasm, but is, you know, still sort of connected at the bottom there, you know, like it's, we, we can sort of smooth it out because I think, you know, I, I think like in the same way that I feel like a lot of movies actually just want to be <laughs> porn. I think a lot of novels actually want to be horror novels, but are afraid to go there. Um, I know that in, I realize I'm being a little vague here, but I know that in my own way, because when I was writing Hawk Mountain, I was really stuck, even though I had a lot of it basically laid out, I was really stuck on how to sort of pull off certain parts of it. And then I was hanging out with my friend, the young adult writer, Holly Black, who's mostly known for writing the Spiderwick Chronicles. Mm -hmm. And she just said, oh, you're writing a horror novel. And it just sort of, everything opened up in that moment. I was like, duh, yes, I'm writing a horror novel. Why am I trying to keep this not being a horror novel when like, that's all I want to do is write a horror novel. Now I know a lot of people and, and I'm sure you guys will bring this up, but like, I'm, I know a lot of people will probably read this book and not think it's a horror novel and that's fine. I mean, the people can take it however they want. I mean, I've, I've I'm a little sad sometimes hearing that people are disappointed that it's not delivering horror in the way that say, um, I don't, well, like it or, you know, um, the troop or something like that, or, you know, delivering horror, but, um, it is a horror novel for me. And it is also a literary novel and it is also a crime novel. And I think that when I understood though, what horror had to offer me as a writer, then I really was able to pursue it. And so just to say like, 
it's horror in its own right that we should take seriously and then and 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 then just say okay well this has a lot to offer the literary world is the literary world the literary fiction world listening um because there's a lot to be taken seriously here and we can talk about what all those things are in a minute but i just want to say like if you're a horror writer horror creator whatever like don't ever accept that like you need to just be listening to what literature has to offer you that that's great too because some like i said some people just get stuck so in genre that it can make their imaginations quite contracted but um or or claustrophobic but for those of us most of us who enjoy horror that that's not happening to um just understand you really have something to offer so don't self-signatize just actually try to figure out what it is that's valuable there um I feel like there's so much more of a scope to the question you asked though. So maybe I'm going to step back from my long answer and let you say like, am I missing something from responding here? Cause I feel like maybe I'm not being so specific. Well, I mean, I think in terms of what you're saying here and you know, people perhaps criticizing it cause oh, it's not it or it's not the truth. And well, for people who want those books, they can read them. That's the good news. They're still <laughs> on the right. shelf. <laughs> but I mean, it sounds like your approach to writing, and I would imagine, you know, you, your approach to all oh, your artistic endeavors, whether it's writing, whether it's working as an adult performer, whether it's podcasting, is, is to almost have that punk aesthetic you spoke about where you're liberating it and you're going beyond the familiar constraints. And I mean, I think that's a good thing. And that's something that should be celebrated. We don't want to have, you know, clones and carbon copies and bad versions of Stephen King and Nick Cutter. We want original Connor Habibs. Right. <laughs> right. Thanks. <laughs> I hope so. I hope that that's what people want. I mean, I, and I do think a lot of people, yes, want to be sort of pushed on and, and, and challenge. And I think like, you know, just to sort of reiterate, I don't, I don't like when people say transcends the genre. Um, what I think is, and so for writers who are maybe a little frustrated, like, well, I want to write a horror novel, but I want it to be sad or I want it to be beautiful or I want it to be uplifting at the end or whatever. These things that we don't no normally associate with horror. Like I'm thinking here of one of my favorite horror movies of all time, which is called Eclipse, which is not, not the Twilight movie. It's this Irish movie um, that is like a ghost story that takes place at an Irish literary festival, which is a quite unknown movie, but it's one of the, I think one of the best horror movies ever made. It was very sad and it's very beautiful. And um, so I'm just sort of thinking of that as I, as I speak. So I want to give it a shout out, but I think like people think that they have to break out of the genre but i think a better way to say it is like well what is meaningful to me in this like and how do i use that meaning like rather than conforming to the way that that meaning usually or the trope or the you know um the sort of rules play themselves out what is it here that holds value for me i remember when i first was about to move to la i won't say who this person was but i was really good friends with a huge producer who had made like massive TV shows. And two of them were actually, I think three of them are horror based TV shows. And, um, it was, it wasn't Joss Whedon just to be <laughs> clear about that. Someone else. But like when I, when we were hanging out, he just sort of said kind of, I mean, the guy is like, has so much money. It's ridiculous. And he was just like, hey, why don't you just like be in the writer's room for now and just join the writer's room. You can be a writer for, you know. And I, like, I didn't have any, like, dream about writing for TV or anything at the time or whatever. And I was like, oh, no, that's all right. <laughs> right. So th this was this, like, completely, like, ridiculously privileged, like, hilarious conversation where someone just offered me a job in a writing room at as a tv writer with no experience at all and i was like ah, oh, no it's fine and i look back on that moment all the time the reason i'm bringing it up now is because you know it took me a little while 
but maybe it was like a year later or something. I didn't like wake up in the middle of the night going like, what the fuck did I just do? But I did like, I was just sort of like, I don't know, going through my day. And I was like, why did I do that? Why did I just say no? What I should have done was think about TV, think about the shows that he was making and ask myself what's meaningful to me here and worked with that, like really run with that. Um, and so I tell that story just to say that like when we try to conform to what we think the rules are or what we think the genre is or what we think the themes and tropes are, you know, we're missing the opportunity to actually look at what's meaningful to us about all of those. So like maybe you're sick of vampires, like everybody got sick of vampires for a while. Maybe they're not so sick of them now anymore, but for a while they were just fucking everywhere. So people are sick of it. But could you ask yourself, like, what is it here, though, that does resonate with me? What does this, you know, um, what does this theme or construct or type of monster, what does that give to me? What's interesting about it? And how could I write from there? Even if I'm writing a novel that actually isn't going to be considered a horror novel, how could I bring that into it? And I think that that's it. It's just sort of finding these points um, that we can bring forward with us. Uh, if that makes sense. It does make sense. And I think not only can you apply it to art, but actually if you apply this to all facets of life, then you're probably right. going to live with much more gratitude and just see the world as a more kind of uplifting <laughs> and inspiring place. Like I'm being serious. I mean, if you're mm-hmm. asking in everything, what is meaningful about this? I think it, it's going to be a, a better lens to to view the world through. And I mean, obviously, there's going to be extreme examples of things where it's like, well, definitely the meaningful does not outweigh the fucking atrocious. But, you know, we're, we're not really talking about that here. Yeah, like I'm not saying like <laughs> just find meaning in the horrible thing that happened to your entire family or yeah. whatever. But, yeah. but the fact is like, I mean, but. But the truth is, though, actually, even with that, like sooner or later, you'll have to. Yeah. I mean, there's there's no way to go on without going through this process at some point anyway. So, you know, it's like I've had people who are very close to me, including my mom, died when I was 23. And like, I just, you know, like you have to make meaning out of it, not because you want to live in delusion, but because it has to fit into the context of being alive. And that is, you know, so sooner or later you will undergo the process of making meaning of the things that happen to you, or you'll probably end up becoming like, you know, a psychotic, you know, murderer, which I I think it's better to (laughs) do the, do the former than the latter, you know? Yeah. Yeah. I think on balance, I'll probably Mm -hmm. agree with you there, Connor. (laughs) Mm Mm-hmm. I feel that this is something that, that I've been hitting on with people for a while. And it, it's, it's, it kind of taps into writing fearlessly. And mm. I think we need to write fearlessly now more than ever before. And that means, you know, pushing, pushing yourself, pushing boundaries, but you made an interesting point. It's something I've never really thought about that a lot of the the properties and the books and movies and TV series that we've seen lately that have hit really hard are using to me, and I hate, I'm kind of dumbing it down a little bit, but literary tricks to make their horror even scarier. Mm. If that makes any kind of sense. In other words, like they've, they've taken a trope and they've instilled what, you know, more dramatic elements to it. And mm. is when you when you when you were talking, I was like, "Oh, mate, that makes sense." It's like, it's almost like, well, are things coming full circle? No, not necessarily. But what's happening is that we're we're pulling from from all kinds of aspects of of storytelling to to make horror even scarier. Mm. And uh, uh, is there a way that you can analyze that, or you can, you know, I'm not mm. trying to, you know. To me, it's like okay, you can you can sit there and think about it all you want, but this is just, as soon as you start to think about it and try to figure out how it works, then that's when it's going to actually break down and not work for you. So it has to be <laughs> organic; it has to be natural. And so, 
But yeah, and it all ties into to riding fearlessly, pushing boundaries. Uh, and I think that that's something that's real important, uh, especially, you know, we're, we're in a horror boom right now. And the people that are that are making waves with horror, they're they're not, a, you know, they they push down the walls with their own stories. And that's mm-hmm. I think that's important. And I think that's inspiring that. And I think that that's something that we should embrace rather than, you know, push away from. Yeah. I, yeah. I love that you say that. I mean, I, I'm thinking of maybe examples that are a little older when you say that, like I'm thinking of funny games, Mm -hmm. which is one of the most horrific movies ever. I actually deep, much, much prefer the shot by shot, shot for shot remake with Naomi Watts. Um, but so don't, don't get mad at me. Everybody just heard me say that, but I do (laughs) think like, um, you know, that uses the elements of cinema and you know um, breaking down the wall between the audience and the characters and um just sort of a kind of tech viewing power um and the ideas of horror you know like to really and, and what horror is to like really really get at the audience really implicate the audience mm-hmm. um in a way that's quite uncomfortable i'm also thinking of house of leaves you know which is like well, I'm going to, um, you know, I'm I'm going to use architecture, and I'm going to use everything that's available to me in a sort of postmodern, in this sort of postmodern philosophy, aesthetics, critical theory way to sort of infuse this book with what's, you know, with a different form that will really freak people out, mm-hmm. and you know, even that's in the that's in the story of the book as well, because the whole premise, which is just such a fucking creepy premise is, you know, someone measures his house and it's a foot bigger on the inside than it is, you know, on the outside. Mm -hmm. And, um, and that just shows you that there's like, okay, there's this disjoint, like, I'm going to show you something bigger inside this book than, you know, you thought was possible to have between two covers. And also I'm going to blend these two paradoxical things, this sort of literary critical theory culture with a horror novel and see what happens. And it's obvious that that book has had extremely lasting power. It's made a real dent in the psyche in a way that a lot of, you know, um, horror novels that are great, but they just, they don't have the staying power of a book like that. And it's even if they have sort of gimmicks or tricks or whatever, because it's really just done it. It's done really intensely. And as you say, fearlessly really Mm -hmm. just goes for it. Um, I'm even, you know, I'm thinking about a lot of Paul Tremblay's, you know, stories, especially, but then also the Paul bears club, but head full of ghosts, things that sort of formally bring in, blogs and um and memoir and you know different forms of writing and i think all that's brilliant i think that you know when we when we encounter stuff like that I think it 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 reminds us that you know horror can be anywhere that it can creep into any space and that everything has the potential of being horrific and I, I mean, I love that. I mean, like, just take it like a crazy moment. How many kids were probably really fucked up by seeing Christopher Lloyd dunk an animated shoe into a vat of acid and who framed Roger Rabbit, right? Like, mm-hmm. you, you can find horror anywhere. You can be horrified and messed up by, you know, in, in a productive way by anything. Um, so why are we, again, sort of limiting ourselves um, and, and we shouldn't do that. And I'm not saying we shouldn't, you know what, like I shouldn't say we shouldn't do that. Cause a lot of people just write these like really tight, well-written, you know, great horror books, you know, that are like, they're just so well put together. Um, there's a great horror novel called weeping season by Sean O'Connor. He's a, uh, an Irish writer. And, um, he wrote another novel that was about werewolves. I didn't think it was as successful, but, but we, and that was just sort of a trope kind of novel, 
But Weeping Season is very sort of Hunger Gamesy kind of book. But he constructed it so well that you just it's just so compelling and you just race from start to finish in that book. Um, so I'm not saying everybody needs to do something weird or sort of out of you know what's standard or whatever. Uh, but like go <laughs> like you're saying like really just go for it you can look around the room and see something that horrifies you i mean if even if you just i mean maybe it's a bit sort of socialist for everybody but if you just sit in a room and think about everything around you was created by someone else's labor every object in the room has a story and at some point there's a horror story connected to that mm -hmm. and you're sitting in it <laughs> there's nowhere that you can escape from horror if you trace the story to the horrific point. And so I think, you know, you can do that with literary um, styles and philosophies and songs and everything as well. Mm -hmm. I think, I think a good point too, is that, that a lot of people, they want, they want to try to measure things. And, you know, it's like, hey, what's the yardstick we use for horror? And so mine is a little bit different. And I think I think a lot of people kind of do the same thing, too. But mine is, is are the characters of the story scared? And do you care about the characters? Uh, because uh. if they're scared and you care about them, you're going to be scared, too. That's how you create fear. That's how you do that. And so... And it goes back to these these arguments such as like Jaws is not a horror movie. I'm like, oh really? The three guys on the on the boat were fucking scared <laughs> to death. So that's yeah. a fucking horror movie. Uh, just because you weren't scared doesn't take that away from it. It's like, well, it didn't scare me. I thought it was funny. It was a comedy. <laughs> you know what I mean? What's the justification for saying Jaws isn't a horror movie? How would they say that? Well, there's there's. I think that there's there's part of it that they don't they don't realize that like it's classic film structure basically. I mean, mm -hmm. if you look at horror movies and the way that they're made, especially films, it it follows in like you can take a, a horror movie and say, hey, this is a template, this is how it works, and you put Jaws in there, and it's like, oh fuck, it fits. We're dealing. <laughs> you know, another movie that fits is Oliver Stone's Nixon. Huh. So you know, it's it's basically filmed as a horror movie. Yeah. You know, yeah. long shadows and, you know, weird angles and things like that, you know, and then you could, you could have a similar argument that it's filmed as, you know, classic film noir. So, you know, a lot of things fit, but the point of it is, is that you, if you care about the characters and you, you give a shit what happens to them and they're scared that, mm. that fear is going to to transfer to to the person experiencing to the person reading mm -hmm. it mm -hmm. and so and that's a sliding scale so it's like it, it, it's okay if it didn't scare you that that's all right but it doesn't change what it is yeah i, I mean it, it's a big it's a big question like i'm thinking also of this movie called Cresha, um which is you know, by all standards of the content, uh, I forget the guy actually did make a horror movie. The guy who wrote and directed that did make a horror movie after, which was not as good as Cresha, which is about a woman going home to see her family on Thanksgiving, but she's, you know, an addict and, uh, her life just kind of falls apart in the reunion and they're all kind of wary of her. And, but it's directed like a horror movie. Um, mm -hmm. it seemed quite intentionally, like all the shots are like drawn around, like how people direct horror. So it gives this horrifying, I mean, this is a really freaky movie because you're watching just sort of a regular drama and play unfold itself. But it like, because of the way it's directed in this claustrophobic, jumpy, dark, scary way, it has a completely different effect. And so, you know, you could ask yourself, is that a horror movie? You know, you could even ask, like, is the latest Batman a horror movie? It's certainly directed like a horror film. Mm -hmm. um, you know, it's, you know, it's not, it's not a far cry from seven or, you know, some other movies that mm -hmm. we might consider horror. But I think, yeah, for me, this question of what horror is, um, <laughs> on this is horror is, you know, it's a really great question. Someone asked me that during one of the readings. Um, 
I was talking with Andrea Lawler in Amherst, and Andrea has written this amazing book, which I would not consider a horror novel, and I don't think they would either, called Paul Takes the Form of a Mortal Girl, which is just about someone that um, this person, Paul, who can change to look like any person um, and like just uses the power just to have sex with whoever. <laughs> goes to like all these like different places you know across the u.s and everything and it's just like basically changing to look like a man a woman non-binary person whatever and just having sex with whomever they please and it's a great novel but someone asked in the audience you know uh what what do you consider to be horror what is horror and I was so shocked by how deeply fundamental the question was because people were asking great questions, but they didn't go that deep. You know, sometimes these questions, which are very, you know, uh, just simple, are actually the deepest questions. So I love that you're offering up your definition. And I really had to consider mine. I mean, I really like your definition. And I don't think, obviously, there's not going to be a right definition. Right. Um, Although we all will think that our definitions are correct. So mine is the right one, obviously, but I think <laughs> no, yours, no, yours is pretty great. Actually. I like you're, you're talking about the kind of like mirroring of response, a kind of care, like an involvement in the movie in a certain way or the book in a certain way. And I love that. I think for me, horror is usually, usually has a, an element that's makes you question what's, real and what's not real. Um, and that's why I said before that I think horror is, it's kind of a theological art. It's, it's almost a religious or spiritual art form, which is why I think actually a lot of people crave it because it's one of the only art forms where you encounter religious or spiritual themes in a almost blatant way anymore. There's a great book about this called, um, uh, scared sacred. I think, um, if I got the name that wrong, I'm so sorry. I was just very, limited edition run about this, but uh book about this. But I think like the, the idea being like when you see a werewolf or even when you see a murder or whatever, it shocks you into thinking, whoa, did, is everything I know about the world wrong? It makes you ask a reality question in a way. And that's part of what's frightening about it. I don't think all horror works that way, but that's a theme I see a lot of the time where the kind of lawfulness of the world that you knew falls away. Now, that can obviously not be horror too. Like, I don't think, well, maybe it is, but I was gonna say, I don't think Jurassic Park is a horror movie, but I also don't think that like, you know, The Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe is a horror book or film, you know? Um, I think... So sometimes things can happen that make you rearrange your idea about reality and it's not horror, but it's the shock and the rupture of it that just keeps following you and pursuing you, I think, um, and just keeps echoing out and out and out in, in certain ways. Like you can't escape the rupture. You can't escape the thing that's taken away your uh, connection to the world that you knew. I think that that is a horror quality. I think there are lots of different ways I can answer the question too. So that's just one of them. I have like five different ways of answering it, but um, that's something that maybe I would add because, you know, in, in Jaws, like that is a great example of what, you know, a horror movie and is the best, you know, performing horror film of all time, of course. Um, and I think that like, if you want to consider it horror, and I think that there's so much disbelief and belief and like what's real and what's not real struggle in that movie. I think it brings it into, you know, the, the kind of realm that I was talking about. Yeah. And I think there's such a thin line between what is and isn't horror, particularly because of these varied definitions. And I mean, another definition that I've heard before, I think it was when we were talking to Simon Stranzes and he will say that horror is a lens in which you view the world through. And so if you're to take that definition, then there's actually perhaps an argument that Cretia is indeed a horror film. And yeah. in fact, when you're looking at the credentials and the people behind Cretia, it's not 
difficult to see why people have come to that conclusion. I mean, it's directed by Trey Edward Schultz, who directed yeah. It Comes at Night. It's distributed yeah. by A24, who have put out some amazing horror films such as Midsommar. So all the pieces are kind yeah. of coming together there. Yeah, and that is that's actually an old definition of um, pornography too. That was asserted uh, by this guy Walter Kendrick, who wrote mm. a, a great book called *The Secret Museum*, which is pornography is a way of looking. I, I don't totally agree with him there, but I do think it's a really helpful way to um, consider things because, like, like Bob was saying, like we everybody gets scared of different things. So you know. If you're afraid of spiders, but I'm not, spiders are going to represent horror, you know, or fear to you in a way that like, it's not going to me. I'm not going to look at them with a sense of horror. So, you know, seeing arachnophobia is going to be more of a comedy experience for me than a horror experience. Which is one of the great things about that movie, I think, by the way, was like, it really could divide audiences into, you know, like, how are, how are you viewing it? And like, what kind of feeling does it give you? Um so I, it's also interesting that we're talking a lot about films and not books, because I think books um, do lean a little more heavily into, you know, like you, <laughs> you don't get, you don't get that sort of divided experience quite as much um, when you're reading. But I do think like you're right that it is a way of viewing and I say that a lot of time. Like you can you can turn on horror or turn it off if you want. There's a a quote by I'm gonna mess up the quote, but there's this philosopher Walter Benjamin who says, you know, basically we always live in a state of emergency and there's just sort of rest between emergencies. And I think we always live in a state of horror and there's just rest between horrors. Like, you know, when you talk to somebody, all their organs are you know moving in them their liver is producing bile there's like shit in their guts there's like their tongues are producing saliva and i could go on and on until i grossed you out about what was happening in them and that's happening every time you shake someone's hand or talk to somebody you know and that's you know getting in touch with that kind of body horror or you can just sort of step back and be like no i'm just talking to my friend you know or you could look at uh, anybody who has a baby knows that every moment can be turned into a horror moment if they want it to, because the baby could choke, the baby could fall, the baby could get electrocuted, the baby could drown, the baby could, you know, like the precarity of life when, you know, that can bring horror to you. So it's sort of like, are you going to engage in that way of viewing or not? And it's also interesting to look at what, what things actually force you into that way of viewing that you feel like you have no control over what turns the anxiety on right away is it going to the beach and getting in the water because you can't stop thinking of jaws <laughs> you know or or is it something much more mundane like and and weird to others like do you not like walking past mirrors for some reason because people told you bloody mother mary stories when you were a kid or Candyman stories for that matter you know yeah, and it's unsurprising that we keep coming back to the commonalities between horror and pornography. Obviously, both genres that have been stigmatized a lot, both genres that, I mean, we're not going to say you can easily transcend, because you fucking both hate that term, but you can expand <laughs> it. It's, it's adaptable, it's malleable. And so I, I'm wondering... Too, I mean, working as an adult performer, what do you think were some of the transferable lessons that then helped you as a horror writer? Oh, transferable lessons. That's a good, that's a good question. Um, Cause I don't know that I ever sat down and was like, porn is like this and therefore I can bring this to horror. Except to say that, a lot of the stigma is the same, you know, um, a lot of the stigma and regulation and all that, which means that both genres must be it. And I don't know that I would actually call porn a genre. I might call it its own medium. Mm. Um, cause it's so unlike any other art form. I mean, it does take place on film, but, um, or not film anymore, but you know what I mean? Um, <laughs> but I think like it, I think that both of them 
um, yeah, are just, they experience the same kinds of stigma and, and that means that they must be considering something very important that they must be considering and helping people express, explore, and understand a part of their lives that is for some reason dangerous to the status quo. Um, that is also, uh, very deep and, and usually sort of brushed under the carpet or not talked about. And, you know, it's not as simple with horror as saying that's death because there are lots of horror movies that aren't about death, um, per se. Um, and it's maybe not as simple even as saying that pornography is just about sex and sexuality because there are a lot of aspects of porn that affect people that aren't just about sex and sexuality. It can be about like desire in different ways or seeing certain uh, like key, you know, uh, themes like why is it that certain themes like construction workers or <laughs> like offices or whatever are sites where you know that are depicted in porn as like sites of like desire like what can you learn about sort of power or the way culture and politics work or whatever i think that both these forms like allow people to self actualize in profound ways and they're both like deeply reliant on, you know, defending freedom of speech, um, you know, and if one goes then the other is really fucked. Um, so, you know, they, they have this kind of alliance with each other that's unspoken. And I'm sure there are probably lots of horror people that, you know, horror fans that are like anti-pornography, but probably less so than a lot of other genres and probably also, you know, some porn performers and watchers that think horror is horrible, but there is this kind of handshake there in a way. Um, I don't, but all that is to say though, that like, I don't really know, like, I don't think I looked at porn and was like, this applies to this, except I don't know. That's such a good question. I might have to come back to it because I, I need to really think like what directly applied from one to the other um, as a performer and as someone who thought and talked about sex and culture, you know, with sex workers and people who aren't sex workers alike for you know, a long, long time. Um, yeah, I don't, I don't exactly, I don't exactly know. <laughs> <laughs> That's really funny. I mean, I think maybe maybe the one thing, though, actually, I think I just said it, though, like when I was talking about horror being everywhere, mm. like basic lesson of sex, of Freud and psychoanalysis is that sex is everywhere and it is everything. Um, it's our own big bang story, so to speak. Mm -hmm. Everybody has a personal big bang that you know led to their existence. And so sex is sort of pulsing in everything and you can eroticize anything. And anybody can eroticize you. And I do think that that sort of pervasiveness, I think that that probably is there. And I also think they're intertwined. I mean, there's a moment in my book where something horrific happens and it comes across, I think, as very sexual as well. Because I think when you tap into that thing where you're like, what are the forces that are making the world? And sex is one. And, you know, fear is another. And there are others as well. But like, you can notice the ways that they're entangled. What a fascinating guy Connor Habib is. And if you like that and you want more of that, well, good news, there is a second part and it's coming up next episode. And in that one, we really delve into Hawk Mountain. We talk about the genesis of Hawk Mountain as a short story. And we also talk about the difficulty in categorizing it and putting it in a genre box and whether or not that's actually important. And we also tackle a fantastic question from VR Weather in which she asks about occultists that are relevant to modern horror readers and writers. So plenty to look forward to in that episode. But if you want to listen to it right now, if you want to get it ahead of the crowd, you can. 
just become our Patreon at patreon.com forward slash this is horror. And we really would love it if you could support us. It helps keep the podcast alive. It shows that you really value what we're doing, what we've been doing for getting on for 500 episodes and a decade. So if you want to show your support for this as horror, if you want to register that approval with your wallet, it's patreon.com forward slash this is horror. And not only do you get Connor's episode ahead of the crowd, you get every single episode of this as horror early. You also get to become part of the writers forum over on discord. A lot of us have taken part in writing challenges. Now it is a fantastic way to level up your craft and productivity. You also get story unboxed, the horror podcast on a craft of writing. We just released the first part of our unboxing of Takeshi Miike's First Love. We also put out a recent Patrons Q&A episode. So a load of perks in terms of becoming a patron. So head over to patreon.com forward slash this is horror and see if it's a good fit for you. Okay, before I wrap up, a little bit of an advert break. Horror on Main, a new weekend convention for the horror community. Exploring all the shadows of horror, our guests include writers and actors, but also artists, publishers, directors, composers, and more. We've been going to cons for over 20 years and are changing up the little things to make the big picture amazing. Beyond guests and contests, movies, panels, and podcasters, our layout and programming are designed to further incorporate the very idea of community. Join us Memorial Day weekend 2023 in Hunt Valley, Maryland. Come to the block party and meet your new neighbors. HorrorOnMain.com The Demonic Brilliance Film Festival is a competitive horror film fest of celebrating excellence in horror. Organized by horror filmmakers for horror filmmakers, it is now open for submissions. There are awards in all major categories and a submission fee is just $6.66. 100% of submission fees and ticket sales are donated to charities. Does your film have what it takes to be awarded Best Film at the Demonic Brilliance Film Festival? Check out all the details at filmfreeway.com slash Demonic Brilliance Film Festival. The deadline to submit is August 31st. As always, I like to end each episode with a quote. And seeing as he blurbed Connor's book, and Connor is such a big fan, I thought it would be apropos to end with a little quote from Clive Barker. So here it is. Be yourself. Avoid self-censorship. Love your failures. I'll see you in the next episode of the podcast for part two with Connor Habib. But until then, take care of yourself, be good to one another, read horror, keep on writing, and have a great, great day. This is Horror Podcast.